If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask that you turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the first verse, the Bible says, it is not expedient, expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or, with, or whether out of the body God, uh, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth that seeth me to be, or heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, um, above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord, the Lord thrice, that it might be depart, that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would open it to our souls this morning, that we might receive it as it's written, Lord, that we might understand it and know it more deeply. According to your mercy and grace, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and sometimes uh, I think at least a portion of it is taken out of context, and we find that the acceptance of God's will is not always easy. Now, anything, something, when something's coming down the pipe, we don't understand or perhaps uh, we don't like, uh, we dread, we begin to pray about it and seek the Lord's face, and that's what a child of God is supposed to do. Right. But when it doesn't go our way, then we begin a part that we're not so good at, and that is acceptance. There you go. Uh, that is saying, okay, I prayed, I sought the Lord, but he went this way instead, and now that is the perfect will of God for me. We don't want to accept it that way. We don't want to look at it that way. We want it all to work out and everything to go just as it should. But listen, we live in a very imperfect life and a very hard day, and it's not going to work out every time like you think it ought to be. Some days are going to be tough. Now, going back to our text, it says, it is not expedient or good or profitable for me to, to doubtless to glory. Now, uh, the, the whole chapter is about that Paul could have a big ego if he was not careful. He did not want to glory in himself, but rather glory in the person of Christ. Now, it's a wonderful thing to have an effectual prayer life, but don't measure your prayer life by results. Measure your prayer life by, by your closeness unto God. Because this is what, I'm find, what I have found. If we're where we're supposed to be, if, even if the answer is no, and even if it works out worse than you thought it would, you'll still be very accepting of it. And if you don't, you may not be where you need to be. Maybe the buffet comes to get you where you need to be. And so we find that as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he says, there's some things I'm going to avoid because all it will do is bring pride to me. 
Verse 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God know, but such a one was called up to the third heaven. Now, I want you to see the unusual wording, and it is repeated twice, and when something is repeated in the Bible twice, pay special attention, and not only was it repeated twice, both times were back to back, verse to verse, sentence to sentence thought to thought, and that's this out of body, I don't know if I, now for him to say, I don't know if it was out of the body or not, he must have been out of the body at times, in other words, he was somewhere else, his mind, now that is an apostolic gift, it does not exist today, but I'm just pointing that out to tell you, he had unbelievable images with God. Now, I personally think he knew John the Apostle, and he was probably speaking of John, but he says, I knew him in, I don't know if I knew him in the body or not. And we're going to get to some of the revelations that he speaks of himself that wasn't John's, but belonged to Paul. When we think of revelations, we re re immediately think John's revelation on the Isle of Patmos. But uh, apparently, Paul had some too, and he shared them. In fact, he said this, no, in the last times, perilous times shall come. For, for, and he speaks of people departing from the faith and of what the end times would look. And so he had revelation too. And if we're not very careful, we'll pride ourselves in that. And Paul certainly knew that. And so with that guard up and with that, uh, with, with that being uh, a reality, he was, very, he was very cautious with it. Verse 4, for, uh, excuse me, how that he was caught up into paradise, meaning the abode of God, and heard unspeakable words that is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now, I want you to see that we are not to glory in ability. We're not to glory in lack of ability. We are to glory in our infirmities. You know what? That's health problems. That's uh, crises that come up in our life. We are not to resist them, but rather glory in them. I mean, how do we do that except from the, for the Spirit of God? Oh, wonderful! I have COVID again. This is great! It's not, man, it's not man's thinking, is it? It, it? It's not man's ideas. It's against his nature is what it is. I don't deserve this. Well, let me update the news. What you deserve is a home in hell, but grace intervened and you don't and, and it didn't happen. That's what you deserve. We need to enjoy in our infirmities when when things come down the pipe that we don't understand and we don't we don't know really why it happened. Remember, if we serve a sovereign God, He put it there for your benefit. He put it there for your good. And it's our responsibility to find that. Verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. So if you're glory, you pride yourself in what you do, according to this, you're a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I will forbear, lest any man should think of me above which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now again, I, I call your attention to verse 7 because apparently he experienced revelations just like John did. He did not glory in them, uh, but he did, he did know they would come. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, uh, starting in about verse 52. Very, very much a, a depiction of the catching away. He was revealed that. Uh, he understood that. God gave him that. He said, I won't glory in it, but I certainly did experience. There was given to me 
a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, we uh, really don't know uh, many people, and I tend to think as well, it was probably his vision. I think in the letter, the second letter to Timothy, he says, you see how big uh, of letter I write, meaning the characters were very huge in that letter, so that he could see what he was saying. Uh, really doesn't matter what it was, Notice that he knew it was from God. There was sent to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, when we have illness in our life, our, our immediate response is to go before the Lord and ask it to be God. If we have emotional distress in our life, that's our first impulse is, Oh, Lord, take this from me. When are we going to learn to be satisfied? <laughs> Remember that old song? When I'm resting with the Lord, I'll be satisfied. <laughs> Unfortunately for our flesh, there's a lot of truth in that song, isn't it? Just be, just be happy with what you have. Be, be satisfied with what, what the Lord has provided and, and what he's blessed us with. But that is so outside man's routine ability that we, we don't even think about that. Now, I want you to see that he identifies this, this ailment in the flesh as the messenger of Satan. Now, did it come from Satan? Perhaps. <laughs> he, uh, I think the example of Job is the best known one and the easiest to understand. Job, uh, uh, God says we can take everything, but don't take his life. And uh, maybe he said that to uh, Paul. Take everything, take his vision completely, and he's still going to serve me. I don't know. But he, call, he called it a messenger of Satan. So somehow uh, Paul understood that this was not... A good thing. Anything from Satan, always remember this, has an evil impact on your daily life. Anything that comes from him is not to your benefit, not to your good. It will work to your detriment. That's where his gifts come from. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times. I went before him three separate times and it didn't happen. Now, that, uh, that, that sounds so minuscule to us, does it not? Uh, and the reason it sounds so heartless and seems so routine is because our prayer lives are just that way. They're minuscule. They're, they're, they're very shallow. But listen, Paul the Apostle wasn't that way. And when he prayed, he meant business with God. When he prayed, he went before the throne. When he prayed, it was an effectual prayer. So I don't think this was on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. He went before God. He prayed for this visual disturbance. He asked that it would be removed. And then it just did not happen. I believe he prayed and... <laughs> It may have been four or five years between each one. But I believe every time he right. went, he meant business with God. Right. See, and those are the prayers when we have that moment of prayer, is it not? Not that we anticipate success, but rather that we accept what God's will is. And that is certainly what we need to be in the line of praying is just simply... To do that, to, to uh, go before the Lord, the results of effective prayer. How, how do you measure effective prayer? Most people, I'd say, in the modern day, especially in the health and wealth teaching that we have running out there, Joel Osteen and his wicked crowd, that you measure success by results. But no, no, prayer is not like that. You measure Result, you measure success by how you take the results. How you accept what God's plan is. 
And not only accepting what God's plan is, no, I'm not taking the cancer. You're going to die from it. What you do after you have it. In the interim, when you know there's no hope and death and the time that you, in fact, do die, what, what's going to be the interim? What's going to be in the middle there? Are you going to lie there and, oh, it's me, help me, what am I going to do? Are you going to praise in victory? See, effective prayer, the results are measured in you, not in what happens. Effective prayer is measured in huh, your response to God's plan for your life. That's effective prayer. Verse 9, the Lord Jesus answers him. I want you to see in your King James Bible, it is written in red, meaning Christ audibly spoke. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You ever feel weak and anemic in the faith? I know certainly I do. I, I feel sometimes that uh, what have I really done? What have I, what have I accomplished in 28 years of, of ministry? What, and, and every time I get down that road, I end up feeling very worthless and, and ineffective. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, I begin measuring it by the world's standard. But I want you to see here that Lord Jesus said very, very plainly, I'm not going to do this for you, but I'll give you the grace to endure. I'll, I'll give you what you need. And so, huh, what is the result in this effective prayer life? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. You see, the result in Paul's life was this. It made him happy. He said, I'm uh, I'll, I'll glorify in it. Uh, I understand that I'm blind, and I'm going to use that blindness to the benefit and to the glory of God. That, that is amazing. <laughs> and you know what? He did. He chose those letters out in the prison cell down at Rome that we're still using today. A blind man. Accepting the will of God. Seeing that effective prayer is not getting what you want, but rather it impacting your life to the point whatever God wants, you'll rejoice in it. And, and I don't see that today, do you? Uh, I think if, we, if, if that was the means, you'd see a lot more happy people at church. I think you would see a lot more glory be given unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I think we would see people being glad and happy in the Lord. Now, I want to uh, very quickly look at two different circumstances how these types of prayer fell out. In 2 Kings, we'll read the first one. Uh, 2 Kings 19, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Uh, 2 Kings 19, uh, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says, Thus shall you spake to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, whom the Lord God is saying that to is Isaiah, the prophet, the teacher. This shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, to whom thou trustest, deceive thee, Excuse me, this is the letter that Isaiah is reading. Uh, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done in all the lands by destroying them utterly. And shall thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them by their fathers have, that have destroyed? So Goshen and Haram and, and, uh, and, Rez and Rezeth, and the children of Eden, which were in Tel Shemar? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of, of the city of Zephyrim, and of, of Hana, and Iva, and Iva? 
And Hezekiah received the letter at the hand of the messengers and read it. Now the letter was, you think your God's going to do anything different? Do you think your God, you, you're, listen, if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't surrender to me now, you're going to be dead about this time tomorrow. You'll die with the rest of the nations. You'll die with the rest of the, uh, of the heathen. You're not going to make it. What are you going to do, Hezekiah? Uh, none, of the, none of us in this room has ever received a report like that. We never have seen the enemy so organized yeah. that they're right there in front of us. But Hezekiah did. You remember the prophet... Um, it was Gehazi and Elijah. And Gehazi was grumbling and complaining, saying, you know, uh, what are we going to do? <laughs> There's huge armies and it's just me and you that's all that's left. And uh, Elijah prayed and said, Lord, open this mission. See, and, and then it said that the chariots were, the hills were filled with chariots and angels. See, uh, that, that, that's effectual prayer, is it not? Despite the circumstances, you trust God. Right. It's a very difficult thing to do in the flesh, is it not? But effective prayer, the results of effective prayer is just that, is that you understand that the perfect will of God is accomplished in everything that occurs. Verse 15, he read it, the rest of verse 14, excuse me, and Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He took them letters from that evil king and he got them out, he smoothed them out. He said, Lord, this is it. I don't know what to do. This is the situation. This is what's going to happen. And he put it in his hands. Verse 15, and Hezekiah, and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone. <laughs> you know, in, in the midst of certain peril, he remembers who God is. It's not an accident I've arrived here. It's not an accident that the foe has organized themselves around me. It's not an accident that they said, I'll have your head tomorrow too. This is exactly what you not only knew would happen, that you set up for the testing of my faith. Here it is. But when we get in situations like that, uh, do we think on all those terms? You know, the modern movement is this. Well, we'll just change God's mind. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, be the first one to tell you, you're not going to change God's mind. Now, he may give you a time's mercy. And I say do that, but you're not going to change his mind. This very man, just a few years later, uh, prayed a prayer for 15 more years of life. Mm -hmm. And Jeroboam was born in that the most hellacious king that ever walked the face of this earth. See, we need to be careful sometime what we pray for, Absolutely. don't we? Yeah. And so we see that Hezekiah, first of all, in his prayer, you want effectual prayer? You, you, you recognize whom God is as you go before him. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down now thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. He acknowledged the ability, huh, what, the, huh, what those other kings had done. And have cast their gods into the fire. 
but there were no gods. See, he, he says the difference is we're serving the true God. Right. You know what the difference between us and other people today is we're serving the true God. He said they failed, but they had no God to pray to. Mm -hmm. they, they, they went down <laughs> trusting in the falseness. Verse 19. Now therefore, O Lord God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, and all the kingdoms of earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Now, I want you to see what Hezekiah understanding what prayer is about. What was the last line of his prayer? That the world may know that you are God. Yeah. He wanted to be sustained. and He wanted Israel to be protected. But he wanted the end result, not just for a successful kingdom, he wanted God to be glorified. And he will be, despite our circumstances, despite what we may see as bleak, let God be glorified. Pray that he would be honored in what you do. Now, and, and you know the rest of this, but we're going to, we're going to drop down a verse or two so you can just see how our God intervenes. Drop down to verse 33. By the way that he came, by the same way shall he return, this is the Lord God speaking, and shall come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake, the promise uh, of an everlasting kingdom to David. And it came to pass that that night that the angel of the Lord went and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand, hundred and eighty-five thousand died that night. And when he arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now, so the best I understand this, Sennacherib was the only one that was spared. Looked up and every truth that he had uh, was dead. See, that's the result of effective prayer. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for. Has a very, very routine, small prayer resulted in the death of 185,000 soldiers. That's effective prayer. But more than that, it was his accepting it. You read the rest of this, and after Reb got up, obviously he was tore up. <laughs> he went back home, and his own sons knocked him in the head and killed him. <laughs> See, that's effective prayer. He accepted it. Now, one more place we're going to look at, and uh, fairly, again, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, 2 Samuel 12. Now, if you know where we're going to be reading from, this is where uh, David got himself in a mess by lusting. I've heard some preachers say got him himself got himself in a mess with Bathsheba. Well, listen, it wasn't Bathsheba's issue; it was David's. Because, see, us not understanding what what a kingdom is about. And what a what a a king, a sovereign ruler is, if he says it, you do it. And so when he made this call to Bathsheba, she didn't have the option to say, no, I ain't gonna be involved in this. He was king. And so she did it. So the, the, this this situation arose not from Bathsheba, but it arose wholly and completely from David. David was the instigator. David was the problem. David was the one that was responsible for this whole event. Now with that in mind, uh, we'll begin in verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, and Nathan had just used that little sermon, Thou art the man. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now notice that uh, uh, Bathsheba's first husband's not even brought up. 
If you remember, David murdered him with the active battle. And, uh, uh, but he says, I've done it. I have sinned. I have caused murder. I've committed adultery. And I've tried to cover it up. The Lord also hath put away my, thy sin, and thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, this child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, now I want you to notice two things. First of all, I want you to see that any time we sin, and it, whether it's in the years of David's kingdom or if it's in the years of the day of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we openly sin, it, give, it, gives, uh, it opens the door for criticism of the God of the Bible. And that's exactly what was going on with David. That was his sin. And he says, you compromise the nation, but God's going to let you live. Now, you ever heard sometimes it better be to die than to live? That's about where David was. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. And he said, but this is how you're going to pay. That baby boy's going to die. In, 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 not only to compromise national Israel, but to impact the life of your own child. You know, I've preached all my ministry, get your children in church and you keep them in church. But listen, it's not for your, it's not just for their benefit, it's for your benefit too. Because that's what we're commanded to do. Train up your children the way they should go. When they, old, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Uh, that's just obedience. That, that's what that amounts to. And so we find in the situation that David hears the judgment of God. He said, both, 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 both judgments that are coming. Verse 15, And Nathan departed into his house. He was done with his sermon. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child. Now, we find another instant of prayer. Now, uh, we see that Hezekiah went into prayer for the whole national state of Israel. And you know what? That's not a bad idea. Do you ever pray for the United States? Sometimes I, I have to be honest, I had difficulty because very often I think, well, it's just too far gone. But, listen, the Sodomites' house was next door to the temple when God redeemed Israel. So, I would have to say it's not too far gone. But, sometimes you feel that way. And, and, and so we find that um, despite this situation, that he began to pray for his children. National Israel, in, in his day, and now it's got down to the personalness of a child. Now, national United States, yes, it's a mess. But listen, if one of my children or grandchildren got sick, it takes on a brand new quality, doesn't it? It's next door. It's in the house. It's with you. And that's exactly what happened to David, is it became so personal so quickly. David, therefore, besought, besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house rose and went to him to raise him up on the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And so God, uh, David was so engrossed in prayer. And again, we're talking about the results of effective prayer. We saw the success in Hezekiah's day, and now we see David just to the point when his, when his servants came and said, uh, King David, get you a little water. He would cast it aside and he would continue in prayer for his child. And listen, to understand that, you have to have children. When I was a boy, I didn't understand that type of prayer, but when you have children, you start understanding. And uh, 
So we find that David, uh, his prayer was not to be interrupted. You know what the world will do? The world will try to interrupt your prayer time to the best that it can. Verse 18, and it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw his servants whisper, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came to the house of the Lord. Yeah. That's effective prayer too. Now, the world would say that David's prayer was ineffective because of his sin. That is not true. God had spoken, and so that means it was still effective. David's response to the child to, uh, to the child's death tells me that David understands more about prayer than many of us do. God has spoken, and because God had spoken, irregardless of the response, he began to rejoice. He got cleaned up, he got himself together, and went down to the temple to praise God with the death of his son just occurring a few minutes before. See, that's effective prayer too. It wasn't what David wanted, but it's what God spoke. And so David considered it effective just because God had spoken it. So when we look at our free, feeble little prayer times, and maybe things don't go the way we think they should, your acceptance, I mean, true acceptance, not saying, well, you know, I'm just going to have to be that way, I guess. That, there's no acceptance in that. But David went down and rejoiced in the death of his own son. That's far more than accepting what God is. That's rejoicing in the will of God, even when it's against what you want. Yeah. So how effective is your prayer? I, I believe we can know how effective our prayer life is, don't you? It's contingent, really, on what the results of prayer life, not the results of your prayer life, but your response to the results of your prayer life. Do you get upset when things don't go your way? Well, let me assure you, they're going your way. All things, mm -hmm. all things work together for good to them that mm -hmm. love the Lord to those that are called according to his purpose. Yeah. It may not be pleasant. Yeah. Bearing a child is outside my understanding. But I know it works for his good. It works, it, it works for his own glory. And it, it may be a hundred years down the road. But what's your response today?